I can see if there's any questions while we're talking. Okay. I think this is us. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, just sort of one of those things that we'll just remember for the that we're still live if you <laughs> say anything right after that. usually uh, look at be quiet that long. I mean, it's not, not a requirement, but uh, just sort of one of those things of like, just remember for the, that we're still live if you. Welcome everyone to another special live episode of Growing Forward. Usually, uh, it's the collaborative, are, Kevin, are we good? Be quiet that long. I mean, it's not, not a requirement. Hmm. Okay, welcome everyone to another special live episode of Growing. Oh. Hmm. I wonder why it's doing that. I'm not seeing it go live on Facebook. I'm looking at it on my phone. It says video has ended available soon. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, here we go. Okay, great. We are. All right. Welcome, everyone, to another special live episode of Growing Forward. It's the collaborative podcast between New Mexico Political Report and New Mexico PBS, where we look at cannabis in New Mexico. <clears throat> I'm Andy Lyman with New Mexico Political Report, and I'm joined, as always, by my fellow co-host, Megan Kamrick, a New Mexico PBS correspondent and KUNM's news director, and today we're talking with New Mexico Regulation and Licensing Superintendent, Linda Trujillo. Thanks so much for joining us again, Superintendent. Hi, Andy, it's always nice to be on here. It's good to see you too, Megan. Good to see you, Superintendent. Uh, Superintendent, since the last time we spoke, your department has held two public rulemaking hearings and made some changes to the proposed rules for cannabis growers. And there's a statutory deadline to start accepting cannabis license applications by September 1st, which is dependent on finalized rules. So how is RLD doing in terms of meeting that deadline? Yeah, that's a really good question. And um, we are going to slide under it just in the nick of time. Uh, in fact, we are meeting again this morning. I've been working all weekend. Um, it's, you know, we're, we're dividing up and conquering how we look at the public comments, add the public comments in, make changes to the rules. Um, there's not this last time, uh, there's not been a lot of variety in the public comments. Much of them are um, a, a really the same um, issues. And so it, hopefully this time it's a little bit easier. I haven't found anything to date that's gonna be substantive that would require us to go back out for another rule hearing. Um, of course, we're gonna to have to start having other rule hearings, but the, the, the idea is, is that we're gonna to have to file these by Thursday. And that's the timeline for the um, New Mexico register is they have to be filed by Thursday and then they'll be published on, I believe, August 22nd. Um, which is the effective date of the rules. And so we're going to, we're going to be really close to the September deadline, but we are going to beat it, miss it, or, you know, at least make it um, within a little bit of time. So they actually have to be filed. Okay. This Thursday. Okay. That's interesting. Um, and so you're ahead of schedule, it sounds like. Yeah, we're, we're minimally ahead of schedule. Okay. We would have liked to have been, you know, to be able to file the last um, bunch of rules, but it was pretty clear that there was enough substantive issues that we weren't going to be able to consider it what's called legally a logical outgrowth of any changes. This time, there's not those kinds of substantive changes. Um, I'll just give you an example. One uh, comment that was raised a couple of times in the public hearing, as well as um, in comments, 
was to extend the provisional license from three months to a year. And so what we're proposing is to extend it to six months with an opportunity to in writing to extend it for another six months. Um, and remember, now we're having our first cannabis regulatory advisory committee. And so when I say proposed, you know, they're going to be looking at them tomorrow and they'll be taking into consideration the drafts that we made based upon our research and then whatever changes we've made based upon the public comments. They'll also have access to all the public comments. So our hope is that they'll um, give us a thumbs up for if not all the majority of the rules that we need to file and then we'll move forward with that on Thursday. So in terms of the proposals you hope to file by Thursday, were there a, a substantive changes? You just referred to one based on public comments. Yeah, that wouldn't be considered a substantive change. Going smaller, you know, like saying instead of three months, we if we changed it to one month, that would be kind of an unfair to the public because we said three months and if we drop it down, then people wouldn't have had an opportunity. But to extend it to six months with an opportunity to extend it another 12 or another six months um, isn't uh, outside of what the public would understand as kind of a logical outgrowth of what they had an opportunity to comment on. And so there hasn't been anything to date that's required us to make that kind of change that's completely outside of the scope of what we proposed. Okay, okay. Um, and the what was the reasoning behind shifting the provisional from, now I got my numbers mixed up. <laughs> from three months to, to six, six months. months. Thank you. Possibly 12. Because yeah. um, uh, the purpose of the provisional license is to give potential licensees, these are still applicants, to give them an opportunity to show um, that, let's say they're waiting for approval of their license to sign a lease, um, and or they're waiting um, to get their license, they have to get their business license. So there's a number of things that kind of have to, one falls after the other, and we thought that three months was going to be enough time for folks to applicants to get all of those pieces together and bring them. But there, the, the comments that were made indicated that that might not be enough time. And so mm -hmm. our goal was to try to give enough time and make it open enough that people could get those things accomplished. And it seemed reasonable to extend it to six months with an opportunity for an additional six months. I see. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Yes, we, we definitely heard some feedback around that when we talked to people at in the podcast and at the cannabis conference recently. Yeah. Yeah. Another, another example, Megan, is um, there was a number of comments and we got a number of written comments about the variants. And so um, that was never intended to be a variance from the statute. It was always intended to be a variance from the rules. Um, we can't provide a variance to the statute. And so what we've done is we've added into that variance language, clear language, just, just one little piece that says it cannot deviate. A variance cannot deviate from the statute. So, so that was, again, that was like, there was a lot of comments, particularly from the water um, uh, advocates for water in New Mexico brought that up. The variance that, that, that we weren't allowed to allow a variance from the water requirements. And that was never the intention of the variance. And so we clarified in the rule that it was not, does not include variance from the statute, only from the rules that we, um, that we, you know, are going to adopt in response to the statute. Got it. Superintendent, I noticed uh, there were a couple of people appointed to the Cannabis Regulatory Advisory Committee that were not, or I didn't see them listed as applicants, namely uh, Pueblo, uh, Pueblo of San Ildefonso Governor Perry Martinez and medical cannabis patient uh, Nathan pa Paolinelli. Um, I know there were some positions like representatives of law enforcement, the Public Defender's Office and District Attorney Association that had to be appointed by those certain organizations. 
but can you explain why there would be appointed members that uh, maybe didn't apply in that initial uh, applicant application yeah, process? Absolutely, Andy. That's a really good question, too. Um, when we asked for the applications for the Cannabis Regulatory Advisory Committee, um, we knew that we would potentially get some applicants. We weren't sure that we would get enough applicants. We got a lot of applicants in the long run, but we also talked to other stakeholders outside of that application process to make sure that we were having voices that were heard. And a couple of the stakeholders that we communicated with is giving the tribes, pueblos, um, and reservations an opportunity to submit. And so that was like in addition. In fact, one of the things that we had talked about early on is maybe not even put that um, position on um, as uh, looking for applicants, but we decided, you know what, we're gonna go even above that. So we put it on the list looking for potential applicants for that position, um, but we also talked to outside interested parties. And the name that ultimately was chosen was a recommendation, um, I believe from uh, Picaris Pueblo, I believe was the one who um, recommended it. And it was, a, it, was a, it was a very good recommendation. And so after talking with stakeholders, that was how that decision was made. But it wasn't, you know, appointing people was not limited to the people that were gonna apply for it. That was just one way that we were looking for potential candidates. And I think you'd mentioned this, <clears throat> excuse me, a second ago, um, that the, the, that board still um, would issue a recommendation on the, the current rules, right? Yeah, that's exactly what um, is required is that the board um, make a recommendation. Now it's not a, a thumbs up or a thumbs down from the board, um, but it's hopefully we'll be able to explain where we, where we came up with the rules, the information that was used for best practices. And, you know, my hope is that we've got it right this time, um, but, you know, there could be some suggestions for additional rules or maybe for some language uh, corrections that could still not have to go back out for role hearing. But yes, they have an opportunity tomorrow to recommendation to make a recommendation about the rules that we had the public rule hearing for. One of uh, the advisory board rather includes one member who offers expertise in cannabis laboratory science. And we recently visited a cannabis testing lab for an upcoming episode. Testing standards are probably an important piece in establishing an adult use cannabis program. When should the public expect to see proposed rules for testing cannabis products? Yeah, that's, um, we're actually in the process of contracting with a firm, the same firm that um, helped us with the initial analysis. They've been working with other states. We'll probably get information elsewhere, but that's a pretty scientific process for us to undertake. And we don't feel that we have the expertise in house at the department um, in order to move that forward. And so we're contracting to um, bring this company in. They're gonna do some stakeholder meetings with individuals from uh, the environment department, the agriculture department, individuals that are currently in the industry. Um, they're gonna do those kinds of stakeholder meetings um, to get input. And then they'll also be looking at best practices around the country and ultimately um, come up with a draft that we'll be able to propose to the committee. And the, in, in this instance, we're hoping that the committee will have an opportunity to make a recommendation. Now that they're appointed, um, they'll be much more on the front end of things instead of um, where we're kind of at right now because of the timeline. Uh, I apologize. We did have a question in the Facebook chat. I did not see it. Um, our producer just alerted me. Rosalie Flores was asking about the unlawful variance mechanism. OSE clearly stated during a presentation that a business 
could apply for a variance to get approval until water rights were proven. Please clarify that point to OSC so they are not misleading applicants. And I'm yeah. Tell me, remind us what OSC stands for as well. State engineers. Um, Office. Office of the State Engineer. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so the the variance is not an is not an option again to get a variance from the statute. The Cannabis Regulation Act cannot have a variance. That is set by the legislature and we're um, required to follow it. Um, what the variance does is gives potential licensees an opportunity to state their case. Let's say um, the example that I could give you is we recognize that there's gonna be some micro producers who are out really in the middle of nowhere, right? I don't mean that disrespectfully. I just mean there's not roads around them. There's not houses around them. Um, and maybe a fence is not necessary. I don't know. But we couldn't come up with an idea as to how do we give, um, how do we make it easier for a micro business? And how do we make sure that we don't have onerous regulations that are kind of carved in stone? The variance gives us the opportunity to consider those kinds of variances that are not statutorily mandated, but potentially could not be necessary for a small business that doesn't isn't in a, a, a populated community. Um, the the so that's what the variance is required, and the reason that we set it up as a public uh, uh, hearing is because we wanna make sure that the public and interested parties have an opportunity to comment on that variance. It's very similar to the kind of building variances that we have in our communities, um, where you've gotta go before the, the committee. In this case, you're gonna go before probably a hearing officer appointed by the, depart the division. You'll state your case, you'll give your facts, and then the hearing officer will make a recommendation and the department division will ultimately make a decision. But it has nothing to do with whether or not you have to prove that you've got water rights or that you've got access to commercial water. Where the what what might have been heard is that the provisional license gives folks an opportunity to go and get all of those things. But it's important to remember that when you've got a provisional license letter approval, that you cannot start your business. And it, and it doesn't even mean that you're going to start your business. It just means here's the list of the things that you've turned in that the division has approved. And here's a list of the things that you don't have yet. And you have to provide in order to be approved. And if water rights is on the list of what you haven't provided or a business license is on the list of what you haven't provided, you will not get to function as a cannabis producer or any other type of licensee until you've provided that particular document. That's what the provisional license is about. And again, it goes that chicken and egg thing where we've talked about this before, that we're requiring a business license to show that you're meeting local requirements, zoning and such. And the local community requires a license from us to show that you're properly licensed under the Cannabis Regulation Act. We can't put licensees, applicants in that position. So the provisional license gives them that assurance. They've met all these qualifications and all that's left is these. Uh, before I get to my next question, um, uh, or before we start to wrap up, I just wanna remind uh, anybody watching on Facebook, uh, to drop your comment in there if you have a question. Um, but superintendent, speaking sort of of this jurisdictional issue, uh, the city of Albuquerque adopted zoning requirements for cannabis businesses several weeks ago, and now officials with Chavez County, which includes Roswell, are considering some restrictions that might include hours of operation and no sales on Sunday. And then in addition to that, there was uh, talks in Santa Fe County of limiting personal grows to indoor only. Can you explain where RLD's jurisdiction ends when it comes to this local control issue? Yeah, we actually don't have jurisdiction over those things that you're talking about. So to the extent that a local jurisdiction can determine um, time, place, and manner restrictions, that is completely within their jurisdiction. And originally, we thought that the location to schools and daycare was within our jurisdiction. 
We got legal counsel, but it was not. It is limited to the local jurisdiction. And so that will not be in our proposed, in our ultimately adopted rules. Any reference to location is going to be limited to the local jurisdiction. Now, whether it falls within the guidelines of what the statute allows a local jurisdiction to determine is ultimately going to be determined by the courts. It, but it's not within our power to make those kinds of, of, of restrictions or to enforce it. Which would mean that somebody would have to challenge it in court. It's just just so uh, anybody watching knows that it's uh, not the courts can't just decide to take this up. Yeah. Somebody has to no. file it with the courts. That's right, Andy. Thank you. I do have one more question, Superintendent. We did an interview last week um, and it was uh, someone in Las Cruces who raised an issue I hadn't heard before. And again, this might not fall under your jurisdiction, but they uh, had a letter from the Water Utility Authority basically saying, because the authority there or the water supplier gets federal funds, ergo they could not supply water for someone who's going to grow cannabis. And I was wondering if this has come up and I don't, if this, what happens, what is, what happens in this case? Is this something that falls under RLD's purview? I know we're in weird territory here because it's federally illegal, yet we're legalizing it here. Yeah, that's really interesting. I haven't heard that particular um, scenario um, and certainly can't provide legal guidance for the commercial water source. That's something that that local community is going to have to have to figure out, but we'll require that there be some sort of documentation that you have access to water, and that you have and that you can use the water for agricultural purposes. Um, it, it is important to note, though, that we haven't begun talking about manufacturing, and under the statute, the manufacturing um, type facilities will also have to prove that they have access to water. So it's not just the producers. We do have another comment from uh, Jacob uh, who says Bernalillo County, then Santa Fe County look too overrepresented to me. This leaves rural communities underrepresented and will likely lead to equity issues down the line. What do you think about getting representation in rural communities? It was something that we tried, um, that we spent a lot of time trying to make sure we do have uh, representation from some rural communities. Uh, it, it would be nice if we had representation from every corner of the state, but there's not enough positions on there. Um, and so I, I would say I do believe that there are some rural community representatives on the uh, committee. And um, to the extent- We should clarify, we're, we're talking about the Cannabis Advisory Board, I think. Yeah, yeah, I believe that's the case. And so um, I, I think regardless of-, of of the numbers, there is some representation from rural communities, and we're excited about that. There's at least two from the um, automatically appointed individuals, and then we've got a number of positions. Um, we've got um, uh, Chase Gentry is over from the uh, Clovis Portales area, and Chase worked on bringing the cheese plant to New Mexico. Um, I've known Chase for a long time, and I think he brings a good, valid, rural New Mexico economic development voice to the table. So I, I do think that we've got a, a good balance of that. And I, uh, there are a couple other comments. Uh, um, Andy, yeah, did you want to jump in? I'm sorry. No, that's exactly what I was getting to. Okay. I think there's a question about consumption lounges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, uh, do consumption lounges and areas have to be in a standalone building? So that's, that is really interesting because we've learned that there's going to be, and I've said this all along, is that we have to think of consumption as more than just smoking, right? Smoking is going to be one medium and the law requires that if you're going to do smoking, that it has to be in an outdoor approved outdoor area where the smoke can't get into other areas that are protected by the, um, the D. Johnson Clean Air Act or it has to be in a standalone building so that the smoke again doesn't get into other um, areas that are protected. And so if you're gonna do smoking, then yes, those are the two requirements, but there's other ways of consuming cannabis. And you know, we've seen some rather creative ideas that could be popping up 
um, uh, meals uh, around cannabis, uh, different kinds of edibles. And so I think people are gonna get really creative and um, as we move forward in that, I think there's going to be even more creativity. But smoking, yes, those two requirements. And I apologize, Rosalie did have, I didn't see this till now, she had a follow-up on the variance question. She said, if the variance does indeed remain, it should apply only to micro-businesses, not uh, to be allowed to large operators, if the reasoning offered is indeed to benefit small businesses. Yeah, we're not going to, the, the variance is not intended to just be for the micro businesses. We do believe that, um, that even businesses who are going to grow more than 200, because keep in mind, micro business producers are limited to 200, but there may still be individuals that go just above that 200 threshold that are still considered to be small businesses. They're still considered small businesses in many respects. Okay, the consumption area has opened up several questions. <laughs> Sorry to jump back and forth, folks. It's okay. Um, it's okay. Will, will there be a special event consumption license available? And I'll, I'll combine it with this. Can vaporizers be used inside, not smoke? Yeah, I am not the expert on vaporizers. I so I'd have to get some, you know, some guidance on what that means. Um, I think there's still smoke connected to that, but I don't know. So I don't want to really talk about the vaporizers unless I can get, until I can get more uh, educated on that. But we have heard individuals, and that's why I say, I think there's going to be a lot of creative ideas um, around consumption areas. And as we explore those, um, we're certainly going to be looking to the public to provide us some ideas on what kind of consumption areas might be popping up. And then once we start drafting those rules, then we'll have a better idea as to what could, content, could considerably you know, be considered um, and what won't be. I think the, the high priority is gonna be how can you have consumption and ensure that kids um, 20, under 21 are not gonna have access to it. And so, I, 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 we're really pretty open to that because I think there's a lot of creative ideas that are out there. So the idea of a special event consumption license might still be in the offing. I, I think it's still, it's still on the table that, that the consumption areas are not something that we have to have the rules ready for until January. And so I think there's still a lot of conversation that can be had around that. And what we end up with, I don't, just don't know because I couldn't have told you in January what the producer rules were gonna look like. I think it, everything is on the table right now. I don't wanna keep you for too long and we do have to wrap up here pretty soon, but speaking of those special event licenses reminded me, um, it, it seems like there might be some other events. We talked about Speakeasy uh, earlier, the, the, the place that got the uh, cease and desist letter, which they complied with, but I've been hearing about a lot of these other events like a, a, a dining event um, is, is RLD continuing to sort of monitor those things and, and let people know that you can't do that until um, the license or until, until the, the framework is set up? Yes, that's exactly right. And um, keep in mind that um, under the Department of Health rules, which are now RLD rules in regards to the licensing of cannabis establishments, they do have consumption um, type licenses available. We haven't had any requests for that, but regardless, they would still only be limited to medical um, registry patients. Um, and so, so that's really kind of the, 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 the issue right now is that it's limited to medical. It's not allowed for adult use um, outside of medical, but we are doing our best to kind of keep track of that. I think it's important to point out that the law gives us the authority um, to license and to revoke licenses. Um, we have limited authority for a cease and desist, but when there's criminal activity, um, then we have a responsibility to report that to the Department of Public Safety. And in all instances we have and will continue to do. Well, I, I thank you so much for joining us, Superintendent. I think we can probably uh, take questions for a, a lot longer than we have. But we could. So I, that's why I wanted to ask you if you want to answer more questions, it's up to you. We have a couple more. 
Yeah, I'm good. I'm okay. good. I don't, I don't have anywhere I have to be until okay, a little good. bit later. So yeah, I wasn't sure how much time we had with you. Um, packaging, will more environmentally friendly protocols and practices be incentivized or promoted for cannabis packaging? There's so much waste in medicinal packaging because of mandated regulations. Yeah, that's something that we're definitely going to be looking at. We haven't actually started the process of um, rules in regards to package, packaging and labels. One of the things that's happening across the country, though, is what's been referred to as kind of the Hollywood video um, idea, where you've got packaging that you go into a dispensary and you can see, but when you walk out of the store, you've got a plain package that has the warning labels on it. Um, and that's what you that's what you leave with. That's kind of a uh, an effort that's moving forward, like I said, a, a, in different places across the country. And it has two um, benefits to it. One being the limited waste of packaging, um, but the other being that it's less appetizing for children. And uh, Colin actually wants more openness and transparency around how the Cannabis Advisory Committee was selected. He says the public has no idea how those members were chosen. We have serious ethical concerns about the selection process, some of the individuals involved. We have submitted an open government request to RLD from the citizens of New Mexico and the New Mexico Patients Collective seeking public record. Yeah, and we'll come, we're happy to comply with any request for inspection of public records. Sometimes, as you know, Andy, it takes us a little bit longer than we anticipate, um, We've, but, but we're doing our best. We've got, in fact, we're trying to bring on two additional um, paralegals that will um, be available to help us to move those forward even quicker. But we're happy to, re we're happy to comply with whatever um, requests come in and will. Jacob is also wondering how local governments, which need your direction, um, will be communicated with. Oops, I just scrolled up too hard. Do they reach out individually or how is that happening? Yeah, so I have been working very closely with AJ Fort and Larry Haran um, to try to um, have, and I've had a number of workshops. I had a two and a half hour workshop where uh, county jurisdictions, elected officials and staff who are impacted by making these ordinances had an opportunity to participate. It was very well attended. Um, I also um, helped with, uh, and I think it was about the same, about two and a half hour presentation for um, municipalities. And we had lots and lots of participation on that one also. I have met, and, and my staff and I have met um, specifically with Las Cruces staff. We've met with um, Santa Fe staff, we've met with, um, I'm trying to think, uh, Rio Rancho, we've met with Rio Rancho, and we, we take calls, and we try to answer their responses, but we are kind of like moving our, our, our involvement and our, our information towards the associations that represent those local jurisdictions, so that they can have more of a kind of a unified response. And, and so those associations are helping us to get the word out. I just lost my, oh wait, here we go. <laughs> um, let's see, I'm not sure I have the most recent. Uh, sorry, I'm scrolling through this on my phone. That's okay. Um, there was also a question, uh, let's see. I do see a question yeah. here. I think I might be able to help answer. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding uh, filtration with the uh, HVAC system, um, Nick is asking why can't it be used for consumption lounges to prevent smoke transfer uh, to allow people to avoid needing to use a standalone building? I, I don't know. I'll, I'll ask for clarification on this, but I think that that might you might be limited to, to statute on that, right? That's exactly right. The statute requires that it be in an outdoor approved smoking area under the D. Johnson um, Clean Air Act, or that it be a standalone building. And the language in the act is specifically that. And it's, it's, the language is very similar to the language from the D. Johnson Clean Air Act for uh, uh, cigar lounges. It's very similar to that. And so we cannot go outside of that. 
This is a question that has come up occasionally in our podcast. Does the Real Estate Association have the power to ban home grows against renters or do landlords have the power? That's a really good question that I just don't know um, whether they do or they don't. I mean, I think, uh, you know, what I've tried to kind of bring to the forefront is if you're renting or leasing, you probably should, in fact, check with the um, entity from which you're you're renting or leasing. And I, I don't know the laws around uh, leasing and renting and whether they could, in fact, have those kinds of restrictions. One other question, I think that this goes back to, again, the difference between statute and rules uh, is a question. It said, Carlos asked what the thought process was in not including a cannabis law attorney in the regulatory advisory committee. Again, I think that was what the statute outlined for the, the committee, right? Yeah, that's correct. That's, that's exactly what the statute outlined. Um, we are in the process of, and right now, you know, we don't have any positions. And so what we're trying to do is contract with folks. And so um, we are in the process of contracting with a couple of attorneys, um, or at least looking for some attorneys. We're going we're gonna to do some small contracts but um, we're going to also go out for an RFP so that we can try to get some attorneys that actually do, in fact, have some uh, a, a background in cannabis regulation. Um, I'm not sure I'm reading this right, but it's a question that keeps coming up about patients getting priority as we go to recreational cannabis. David's asking if 18, 19, 20-year-old patients can grow their medication now, or if there are more than two adults growing in the home with a patient in the same home, but wants to grow. I guess the upshot is how does the patient get priority as we move to this new recreational um, framework? So I, I don't believe that there's any kind of priority. Um, the law allows up to six plants for an individual up to 12 plants for a household. That is across the, um, that's across the spectrum. There's not any specific designation for whether you have to be a medical patient or not. Um, there is some question about uh, 18, 19 and 20 year olds. Um, as I look at the statute, I do believe that they have the ability to grow, um, but this has been brought up with legislators and will be uh, considering potentially some amendments to clarify um, that they have the opportunity to grow. But a priority, I'm, I don't think there's any, if you're going to be in a household that has um, a medical patient, that, that's kind of a family thing, I guess, that you're going to have to work out. I think, in, and maybe the question was uh, also, it seemed to me that they were asking also um, if you're, because right now the statute says there's no more uh, PPL or personal production license, um, you can be 21 and grow. But I think the question might be for if you're if you're 18 or even younger than 18, you can be a patient. Um, so if you're 18 to 21, could you still grow your medical uh, plants? I guess without uh, um, without those, legal action. Yeah. yeah, we believe that you can, but it's not real clear. It does seem like it's a little squishy. It was brought up during the special session by the Department of Health. Um, but it was it was very late in this in the in the process, and um, we looked at the statute, and we 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 feel that a medical patient who's 18, 19, or 20 can in fact grow up to six plants. Um, we also believe that the statute is is broad enough that it allows someone who's 18, 19, and 20 that has um, direct care for a medical patient that is under 18 to be able to grow up to six plants. We do believe that the, the statute allows for that under the Lynn and Aaron Compassionate Use Act. But again, um, it's not real specific. It's kind of, you, you have to kind of get to it or in a roundabout way. And so it is on the table for discussion right now as to whether or not we need to put clarifying language in the statute to ensure that that's the case. I think uh, it's probably a good time to wrap up. I know there's lots of questions uh, or, or comments uh, on the thread there. Um, and apologize if we didn't get to yours. Um, but uh, thank you, Superintendent, for thank talking you. to us today. I always enjoy coming and talking with you guys. I, and I love the questions that come up. Believe it or not, 
the questions that come up and the comments that I hear from the public really do help form um, the directions that we're going and, and how we look at licensing and how we look at regulation. It's really incredibly important. So thank you for letting me come on again. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you all for your questions and for watching. <laughs> yes. Yes, this was, uh, as if you're just joining at the end here, this is another special uh, live edition of Growing Forward, the collaborative podcast between New Mexico Political Reports and New Mexico PBS that looks at cannabis in New Mexico. Uh, thanks for everyone for joining us in the questions. Don't forget to subscribe to Growing Forward on your preferred podcast platform so you can catch the latest episode. I'm also getting a notification from uh, um, uh, Linda Trujillo's uh, helper here that people with more questions can email uh, the Cannabis Control Division at rld.cannabiscontrol at state.nm.us, which I also believe that's online if you go to the, the website. So thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks for everyone for joining us today. Thank you.